Queen Victoria may be amused to learn that education has changed little in its approach since her day. Pupils gathered in schools, sat in classes, listening to an adult. But a breakthrough to a new era could be about to happen. In this program, we'll be exploring developments that could reshape education in a single generation. Developments in how we teach. One particular um, area of research is in digital paper. The idea being that you have something that is, is a relatively familiar device to you, it's something you can take with you and, and you can roll up or screw it up and put it in your pocket, but that it can, it can display a whole range of media. Developments in where we teach. I think the concept of schools as like these factory-based systems is fated to wither, and I think the walls will start to go and education will start to be dispersed into the community in all sorts of interesting ways. And developments in who or what does the teaching. It leaves the teacher accessing and developing new skills. There'll be supporters of learning, brokers, mentors, facilitators, quality assurers, um, leaders, you know, leaders towards where students and families will access the education. We'll also be asking whether the future can already be found at this school in the United States, a school which offers the ultimate in personalization, with no timetables, no lessons, and no teaching. I don't have any doubt that this model is the future, because we don't really think that people learn much from teaching. Uh, they learn, learning is a, is a self-initiated process, it's not something that happens from outside. Of course it's impossible to see into the future, but it is possible to recognise the potential that's being offered by emerging technologies. Virtual headsets, so like in World War One, you could go back and see how people fought and stuff. These predictions are from Year 8 pupils at Ashton Park Secondary in Bristol, in a session led by a researcher from Future Lab an organisation set up to support new technologies in education. A hologramic teacher that's by your, on your table, so if you don't get it, you ask the hologramic teacher, and she'll tell you what to do. It may seem like the stuff of science fiction, but fantasy could turn into reality because of the expansion in computing power. Processing speed and memory capacity is increasing at an inexorable rate, in line with what's called Moore's Law. Moore's Law sets out that the number of chips on a piece of silicon will double roughly every two years and at the same time as they're doubling the, the price of those chips will become an awful lot cheaper. So a piece of technology today that costs about a thousand pounds in about 10 years will be worth about 32 pounds. In about 20 years time it'll be about a pound. It means computing becomes more powerful, more affordable and as accessible as paper. However, there's no reason why um, that couldn't be automatically updated every time there's new content. And whether that be every three months, or even updated daily with, with new stories as they emerge, or even someone's blog that's updated half daily or every hour. Another real possibility is 3D simulators, which could become as common as interactive whiteboards. Now, the sorts of reasons that's quite exciting is the way in which you can completely transform the space the learners are in. And you can take a classroom to be, or you can take a classroom uh, back in time and make it a Victorian classroom, for example. Uh, and you can have children wandering around the desks or, or looking at the relationship between their real environments and touching the tables and then looking at the virtual environment they're surrounded in. Um, or you can be going on some sort of expedition and looking at the Himalayas and doing things which you can't do inside a real classroom at the moment. However, you can begin to augment those classrooms and make those experiences, if not real, then, then richer, perhaps. Data storage is also expanding rapidly. It could soon be possible to keep limitless amounts of information. An entire lifetime could be recorded. One of the reasons you want to begin to collect experiences or, or, or data is to help you ref a reflect on, on what you've been doing. So reflection is a very important part of learning, w without question. Um, but also so you can relate different experiences you've had in terms of sharing them with other people. Uh, walking around Bristol Harbour, I, I walked past some really new and modern um, science equipment and, and buildings. And then as I turned right and walked up to the cathedral, a 400-year-old building, that ju juxtaposition between the old and the new is, is really striking. So at the moment, I, I'm perhaps struggling to tell you exactly how it was, but if I could project that image to you somehow and help and talk you through my tour, 
then perhaps we can have a richer and more meaningful conversation about the things that I was thinking. Away from technology, another revolution is underway which would liberate learners from the school day and the school building. Derin Harvey, once a head teacher, is now a director of the Innovation Unit. Today she's visiting the Brit School in South London, regarded as one of the most progressive schools in the country, with its emphasis on creative and vocational learning. It also has strong links with the surrounding community, which it serves with its own radio station. In the future, however, education and community could become totally integrated. But next up is a poem by Louis. I suspect that if we're looking 20 years ahead, 20, 30 years ahead, we may be looking at this kind of facility in a school, but it would be open for the community, or this kind of facility in a community that's open for learners. Because I think the issue is, where will the learners be? They might be in the community, they might be with an employer, they might be in a traditional school, they might be in a library, they might be at the police station, and I don't mean because they've been sent there, but because, you know, police, social services, any of the multi-agencies... You're talking about work experience? I'm talking about work experience, but I'm also talking providing learning and education. According to the Innovation Unit, the future is emerging here in Bedfordshire. At Bidenham Upper School, a unique experiment started six years ago when it became not so much a school as an optional resource. These pupils are all registered with the school, but they only attend lessons requiring specialist equipment. I'm a great believer that the current, current education system is a little bit anachronistic. We are beginning to see the early development of what you might call uh, demand-driven, uh, parent-led, collaborative learning that is not school-based, but is community-based. And I actually think this is the way education will go. When the pupils are not at school, they're learning at home or going to other centres in the community, such as this gymnasium. More than 120 children are involved, each enrolled at either the upper school or a feeder lower school. The schools receive funding for them, but hand it over to a network called the Parent-Led Community-Based Education Initiative, or PLACE Initiative for short. Oh gosh, we, we have all sorts of um, activities that take place all week. Uh, on Mondays we've got uh, Italian, that's actually run by the Italian consulate, a native speaker comes in. We have swimming lessons at an open swimming pool for all ages from mother and toddler through to highly competent swimmers. We have uh, French groups, art groups, we have the gymnastics, the trampoline, multi-sports. They can pursue their interests and their talents in a way that is quite difficult in a school situation. It's allowed these two sisters, now coaching younger children, to develop their own talent as gymnasts to national level. Uh, your landing and stretch. It's helped me a lot because I train in the afternoons and I have a lot more leeway and everything because I don't have to be in the school all the time. I can do it at home with my mum, either at night or other times of the day. The initiative mostly uses the upper school for science lessons, paying for the resources and the teaching when all the other pupils have gone home. Here we go. <laughs> this mix and match model of education is almost inevitable, according to the Innovation Unit. A school at the moment, a secondary school, would typically have anything from 600 to 2,000 students. These could be smaller hubs, they could be much smaller units where you would have um, learning mentors, supporters who would be trained in knowing how to access education for the students. So they wouldn't have to be large institutions, there'd be no need for them. They would be niche institutions where the students would have a relationship with guides, coaches, whatever the term would be, but they would ensure and quality assure the education to which those families would be entitled for their children. Biddenham is also providing as much flexibility as it can for all its 1,000 pupils, allowing them out of school and off timetable to pursue their interests. Matt, from Year 12, leaves to attend dance lessons, a skill he's now trying to teach to teachers. They are very good pupils. My best one so far, after about three years of doing it, they're fantastic. 
Is this the future, do you think, blurring the line between teacher and pupil? I think we learn from what they do with us. I think if we can get what they want us to be able to do across, it does help us become better teachers as well, as much as it will obviously do with Matthew if he wants to go into a career eventually where he's leading people himself. One, two, three, four, While Matt hopes his steps and his passion will turn him into a champion dancer, Phil has already realised his ambition. He was given the space and support he needed to create a radio station at the school, leading to a full-time job on BBC local radio. He's returned today to be interviewed about his experience. Didn't the project distract you from your academic studies? I don't think personally. It did pull away from my studies. It, it became part of it and I learned more through doing it during school and because I was spending the time researching A, how to build a radio station, uh, B, how to run it and C, how to make it a success at the same time. I think uh, the idea of a knowledge-based curriculum is, is, is fated to wither. We don't guarantee that children are going to learn certain uh, packages of knowledge like we do in the national curriculum, but they have certain sets of experiences. You have the experience of leading groups. You, you have the experience of perhaps running a sports team for a short time. You have the experience of a foreign trip. So you go to your employer and say, look what I've done. Yeah, look what, look what experiences and, and hopefully the skills that have come from those experiences. Look what, those, look what experiences I bring to you, not look what knowledge I bring to you. Because in a lot of senses, what employers, beyond literacy and numeracy and an ability to communicate, um, most employers w want to actually train you in, in their particular way of doing things um, r r uh, rather than us necessarily uh, try and guess what those employers want. At primary level, Robin Hood School in Birmingham has also reached out to the future and introduced a number of significant changes. One result can be seen and heard in this classroom, where the school's languages specialist is teaching Mandarin. It's a blossoming language that's really um, becoming more and more popular. Where I'm learning it myself, there's loads of courses going, it's not just my course, and it's for, for business, it's one of those languages, I think, that's for the future, definitely. In younger classes, meanwhile, the teaching is no longer dictated by the teachers. The children themselves have a say in what they do and learn during the morning. It's called negotiated learning. Each morning, children plan activities with their teachers and with their parents or carers, who then stay for the first half hour. Want to find the communication area? OK. Parents discuss the options they could do. And say if they're coming on the creative table, they would talk about um, maybe what they're going to make and what resources they would need. There's members of staff who have um, little recording devices and we observe the children to see what skills they're transferring. You know, from the lessons we actually teach them to see if they're transferring those skills into their, their free play and free choice activities. Negotiated learning is being introduced in reception and year one classes, but the aim is to roll it out across the whole school. At that point, we anticipate as a school we're probably going to need to apply for some sort of official permission to innovate but our aim is, is much bigger than just autonomy, it's actually about the co-construction. That's what motivates the teachers because they can see the children buying into education and buying into learning in a way that actually traditional models don't seem to support quite so well. It does very much put a child at the centre of the learning and in that sense it's very much the future. Potentially you've then got 60 children in reception classes You've got potentially 60 different projects or topics they want to cover. Yes, strategically for a school, that, that's the rub. What you're trying to do is lead them towards general areas that you know you have the resources to be able to facilitate. Uh, so it may be, for instance, that as part of the discussions, there's a collective interest in transport or there's a collective interest in dinosaurs. But if more help is required, does it need to come in human form? As these children from Springfield Primary in Sheffield are about to find out, artificial intelligence is starting to become really clever. My name is Ken and I'm here to talk to you about your photographs. When was this photo taken? Springfield School. Thanks very much. Tell me a joke. We haven't finished all the photos yet. 
<laughs> They're the first children to interact with an artificial intelligence developed by Oxford Internet Institute and Sheffield University. Doctor, doctor, I keep thinking I'm a pair of curtains. Doctor, pull yourself together. <laughs> This project is called Senior Companions, an initiative that's being funded not to educate children, but help the elderly. The general idea is to create a computer entity, which could be in anything, it could be in a mobile phone, could be in a laptop, could be a little plastic rabbit, that people will have with them for a long period and will talk to them. It'll help to keep them happy, as a pet is said to keep an owner happy. It'll assess their emotional state, but above all, it will have conversation and elicit stuff about their lives so it gets to know about them and their habits. Similar technology has the potential to enable conversations with figures from history. What's your job? I used to be Prime Minister. What are you now? Are you now I'm dead. <laughs> is it better than watching, say, videos? Yeah. 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 Why? Well, could you get to talk to them? And in when a video, you don't actually get to talk to them. Like this, you can't. Are you scared of Adolf Hitler? I'm not scared of anything. <laughs> I personally would have loved this uh, when I was teaching my topic on World War II. It was kind of his thoughts on Hitler and how he felt during the war. Did he actually get yeah. scared? Was he scared of Hitler? And things like that. Whereas we're just so used to him being this British bulldog figure um, that you don't think about the person inside. It's just this figurehead. So I think that was quite an interesting emotional response from the children. Unbeknown to the children, the questions are being answered not by Prime Minister Churchill, but Professor Wilkes. A human-free version, however, should be a reality in months rather than years. If what you want to do is to learn German verb forms, then there's a whole bunch of stuff where you can get that will teach you German verb forms. But we're talking about something more structured and more interesting than that, something that you learn, as with a real teacher, by asking questions and interrogating. If what you've got here is going to be developed for education, it needs someone out there. Absolutely. Just as in the Companions Project, we've got people on board who are experts in the psychology of old people, because we can't know what old people want in advance. So similarly with education, we, we can't know what will be pedagogically successful. Men will still say this was their finest hour. A different perspective on the future is found at this school in Massachusetts. Here, the future must start by getting away from the past. The Sudbury Valley School has swept away everything that's connected with the beginning of mass education. Classrooms, timetables and teachers. Other traditional schools are based on the idea that in order for a person to learn, you have to feed him information, information that you've pre-digested and pre-chosen. And that has nothing to do with the 21st century, where people are really in control of their own destiny. You're saying that model was created for what, the Industrial Revolution? Well, when the Industrial Revolution started, there were, no, there were no schools, mass education. That was something that was developed when people realized that machines back in the early industrial age did not have the kind of feedback that machines have today. You had to have somebody man them. They, they could do just a certain amount of the work, and the rest had to be done by people. That meant you had to get people who were parts of the machine. There are 200 on roll, aged between 4 and 19. And so long as they keep within the rules, they can spend their day doing whatever they please. I don't see any reason to treat children different from other people. My experience is that they're human beings just like everybody else. And to view a child, certainly after they become articulate and they can make some judgment, which is usually about four or five, to view a child as any less competent to make decisions for themselves than, uh, than adults, it's ridiculous. What are you going to do today? The school is open between 8.30 and 5.30, but children can arrive at a time that suits them, so long as they stay for five hours. The freedom and the being able to do what you want, it's all very nice, but what I think is probably what's helped me the most is simply I've actually met people and befriended people here who actually treated me well. You know, in my old schools, for whatever reason, the majority of my friends weren't really friends. Shows your uniform. Oh, yes. It also has increased my confidence. Hi. Do you know, there are some people who might be a bit shocked that you're spending the school day playing cards. Bridge is a good intellectual exercise. There's like, I and mean, there's some math involved and there's a lot of logic. 
So it's not it's not just a game. It uh, it's useful in like learning and stuff too. I'm making the fifth scarf of this week. Why? Um, because I can, and I just learned how. I like Shakespeare. It's it's just really cool. You're happy doing this by yourself rather than getting in a teacher. Yeah. It's not that hard. It's I'm listening to it on YouTube, and I'm also reading it at the same time. It gives you sort of an idea of how you should say it. What teachers can do sometimes, if a person wants a specific answer to a specific question, they can give them that. But the most of us in life, we go about learning things. I mean, you and I and anybody else, really, if they think about their lives, they'll realize that most of what they got out of life, they've learned somehow on their own, and they found ways to to find out what they want to know rather than have sitting in front of somebody who's telling them. So you expect then a child to sort of stumble across Shakespeare? Or... Well, no, not really, because they're sitting and talking and hearing other people stumble across these things. The whole of humanity stumbled across these things. I mean, imagine yourself in Shakespeare in England, you know? Uh, he wasn't even that much more famous than the other people. All of humanity has stumbled over time over, over the kinds of things that we now treasure. There's no reason to think that people won't pick out of all the world of information new things that people will treasure. There are 11 members of staff employed by the school who keep an eye on the children and their activities. Well, I spend a lot of time walking around and just seeing what's going on uh, so that if uh, people need anything, um, they can find somebody and uh, get the help that they're looking for. Do they ever ask you any questions? Oh, sure. Um, sometimes they're uh, you know, more theoretical questions like, why are the leaves turning orange? And sometimes um, it might be a question about uh, what to do about contesting a traffic ticket or uh, uh, pretty much anything. Another member of staff is a former pupil who went on to find success in two separate careers, one as a chef and the other as a rock star. Cowboy Mac Bell is on the left as lead singer with the Joe Perry Project. James Brown says, I don't want nobody to give me nothing. Just open up the door and I'll get it myself. That's my philosophy. Uh, I try to help maintain uh, the music rooms, show people where the door to the music room is, get them in there, and then I kind of stand back and let them get it themselves. This is a place where the teachers don't do it for you. There's no workbook to follow. It's really learning in the trenches, which more and more with the, the kind of new, new business and, and new uh, possibilities out there, it's a great experience. It's a real experience. No, I never want to break off from you. Next to the music rehearsal rooms is an area dedicated to another popular pursuit, video games. <laughs> well, they wiggle when they're shot. Could someone explain to me how this helps you with your learning? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think it helped a little with my reading abilities, because when I first came here, I wasn't very good at reading because I really didn't find anything that was very interesting. And um, when I first came here, the video games were pretty much text-based. You had to be able to read to use them properly, so I basically taught myself how to read with video games and with the help of a few interesting books. Books can be found in almost every room in the school, but children are not taught to read. They become literate, like everything else, when they want to. What are you working on? Um, just a story. What's it about? Um, I'm not going to say. Pupil empowerment extends to running the school. Whole school meetings make the policy decisions, while a judicial committee enforces the rules. Today, these pupils have been charged with chalking on the pathway in front of the school. The committee decides it amounts to littering. John, how do you plead to littering for crime? Guilty. Haru? Guilty. Lillian? Guilty. All right, all right, all in favor of giving them no. all outside no. pickup next available four days. All in favor? All opposed. Four. Motion passes. Sudbury Valley is unimpressed by moves towards greater personalization or negotiated learning. It has to be all or nothing. It's still patronizing. It's, it, as a matter of fact, it's worse than the most uh, traditional and, and rigid of the, of the other schools. Traditional schools that are rigid, at least 90% of the people who go there hate them and they know the enemy. A school that is 
letting you, allowing you to have a little bit of freedom seduces you into thinking that the little bit of freedom where you're really being manipulated is the real thing. And that opens you to being manipulated all your life. The Sudbury Valley model has been adopted at more than 30 other schools, mostly in North America, but also on a smaller scale in Denmark, Holland, Belgium and Germany. Nowhere is it considered the soft option. It's the hardest school to be in. And you ask the kids, and they'll tell you it's the hardest school to be in. Why? Because if you're told what to do all day, it's like taking care of you all day, right? You don't have to make decisions. Here, a kid has to make decisions. We, we don't, the kids aren't happy here all day. The kids are thriving all day and they're active all day, but they go through all the ups and downs of mistakes, of learning from mistakes, of falling on their faces, of picking themselves up again. It's a very, very hard existence, and they have to prioritize their time, and they have to sit and say, well, what is that I really want to do? They have to really find out who they are. If current trends continue, learners will be taking much greater responsibility for their education. If predictions are correct, technology will emerge to support autonomy in learning at home, in school, or in the community. My name is Ken, and I'm here to talk to you about... Personalization and technology. Two drivers for change which are coming together and creating the potential to revolutionize education for the next generation. It's really a question of where the personalization line will be drawn. But more importantly, perhaps, who draws the line? Politicians, parents, educators, or children themselves? You can look further into the future of learning and teaching and also find a specially prepared set of tomorrow's teacher lesson plans and resources by going to teachers.tv forward slash tomorrow.